Welcome back to Journey with Job. We're continuing on now in the second round of arguments. We look back at our outlining and we have already had chapter 15, which is Eliphaz's second discourse to Job. And now we're moving into, in fact, Job's response to what Eliphaz has just said. Eliphaz basically told him, you know, you don't own all wisdom. Uh, you're not the smartest man that ever lived. Aren't we just as smart as you? What have you been through that we've not been through? Of course, that's easy to say when you're not the one suffering. But that's the way men speak to men. And all that Eliphaz has said now, Job responds in the 16th chapter by saying to him, I have heard many things like these. You're miserable comforters, all of you. Will your long-winded speeches never end? What ails you that you keep on arguing? I also could speak like you if you were in my place. I could make fine speeches against you and shake my head at you, but my mouth would encourage you. Comfort from my lips would bring you relief. Yet if I speak, my pain is not relieved, and if I refrain, it does not go away. Surely, God, you have worn me out. You have devastated my entire household. You have shriveled me up and it has become a witness. My gauntness rises up and testifies against me. God assails me and tears me in his anger and gnashes his teeth at me. My opponent fastens on me his piercing eyes. People open their mouths to jeer at me. They strike my cheek in scorn and Unite together against me. God has turned me over to the ungodly and thrown me into the clutches of the wicked. All was well with me, but he shattered me. He seized me by the neck and crushed me. He has made me his target. His archers surround me. Without pity, he pierces my kidneys and spills my gall on the ground. Again and again, he bursts upon me. He rushes at me like a warrior. I have sewed sackcloth over my skin and buried my brow in the dust. My face is red with weeping. Dark shadows ring my eyes, yet my hands have been free of violence and my prayer is pure. Earth, do not cover my blood. May my cry never be laid to rest. Even now my witness is in heaven, my advocate is on high, my intercessor is my friend as my eyes pour out tears to God. On behalf of a man, he pleads with God as one pleads for a friend. Only a few years will pass before I take the path of no return. And Job continues in chapter 17. My spirit is broken. My days are cut short. The grave awaits me. Surely mockers surround me. My eyes must dwell on their hostility. Give me, O God, the pledge you demand. Who else will put up security for me? You have closed their minds to understanding. Therefore, you will not let them triumph. If anyone denounces their friends for reward, the eyes of their children will fail. God has made me a byword to everyone, a man in whose face people spit. My eyes have grown dim with grief. My whole frame is but a shadow. The upright are appalled at this. The innocent are aroused against the ungodly. Nevertheless, the righteous will hold their ways and those with clean hands will grow stronger. But come on, all of you, try again. I will not find a wise man among you. My days have passed. My Plans are shattered, yet the desires of my heart turn night into day. In the face of the darkness, light is near. If the only home I hope for is the grave, if I spend out my bed in the realm of darkness, if I say to corruption, you are my father, and to the worm, my mother, or my sister, where then is my hope? Who can see any hope for me? Will it go down to the gates of death? Will we descend together into the dust? As Job responds to Eliphaz and telling him the same things, same arguments. And now he's challenging them again. He said, okay, you guys have, you want to say something? Bring it on. Come on again. Tell me more. Tell me more. So he's, he's actually, uh, 
he's actually suggesting that Bildad and Zophar also come back again and give him the same arguments. I can just see him motioning to them as Eliphaz says what he says and he responds. Now he's pointing at Bildad and Zophar. I say, come on, you have something to say? Let's do this. Give, give it your best shot. And that's exactly what we find here as we go. And the next person up is Bildad as he speaks to Job thusly. The Bild Bildad Shilite replied, when will you end these speeches? Be sensible, and then we can talk. Why are we regarded as cattle and considered stupid in your sight? You who tear yourself to pieces in your anger, is the earth to be abandoned for your sake, or must the rocks be moved from their place? The lamp of a wicked man is snuffed out. The flame of his fire stops burning. The light of his tent becomes dark. The lamp beside him goes out. The vigor of his step is weakened. His own schemes throw him down. His feet thrust him into a net. He wanders into its mesh. A trap seizes him by the heel. A snare holds him fast. A noose is hidden for him on the ground. A trap lies in his path. Terrors startle him on every side and dog his every step. Calamity is hungry for him. Disaster is ready for him when he falls. It eats away parts of his skin. Death's firstborn devours his limbs. He's torn from the security of his tent and marched off to the king of terrors. Fire resides in his tent. Burning sulfur is scattered over his dwelling. His roots dry up below and his branches wither above. The memory of him perishes from the earth. He has no name in the land. He is driven from the light into the realm of darkness and is banished from the world. He has no offspring or descendants among his people, no survivor where once he lived. People of the West are appalled at his fate. Those of the East are seized with horror. Surely such is the dwelling of an evil man. Such is the place of one who does not know God. Now Job immediately replies to this in chapter 19 when he says, How long will you torment me and crush me with your words? Ten times now you have reproached me. Shamelessly you attack me. If it's true that I have gone astray, my error remains my concern alone. If indeed you would exalt yourself above me and use my humiliation against me, then know that God has wronged me and drawn his net around me. Though I cry violence, I get no response. Though I call for help, there is no justice. He has blocked my ways so I cannot pass. He has shrouded my paths in darkness. He has stripped me of my honor and removed the crown of my head. He tears me down on every side till I am gone. He uproots my hope like a tree. His anger burns against me. He counts me among his enemies. His troops advance in force. They build a siege ramp against me and encamp around my tent. He has alienated my family from me. My acquaintances are completely estranged from me. My relatives have gone away. My closest friends have forgotten me. My guests and my female servants count me a foreigner. They look on me as a stranger. And I summon my servant, but he does not answer. Though I beg him with my own mouth, my breath is offensive to my wife. I am loathsome to my own family. Even the little boys scorn me. When I appear, they ridicule me. All my intimate friends detest me. Those I love have turned against me. I am nothing but skin and bones. I have escaped only by the skin of my teeth. Have pity on me, my friends. Have pity, for the hand of God has struck me. Why do you pursue me as God does? Will you never get enough of my flesh? Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. If you say how we will honor him, 
or hound him, since the root of the trouble lies in him, you should fear the sword yourselves, for wrath will bring punishment by the sword, and then you will know that there is judgment. Here very clearly Job is responding to him in this 19th chapter. Bildad's book is Peace. Job responded to it. And right after that now, it's the next guy's turn, which is Zophar. As we go through our outline, we're keeping pace here in our second volley here. The, this is the second round of arguments. Eliphaz in chapter 15, Job's reply in 16 and 17. Bildad in chapter 18, and we just saw Job's reply in Job 19. As we're moving along in our structure here, it's important that we keep a mentality of the process that we're seeing, recalling that we started off at the very beginning with this understanding of Job in the setting of the stage in his place of contentment, and Satan coming and tempting and asking, and then he'd been given permission to try Job, and then the friends of Job's, Job coming, and the argument begins after he gives his perspective in chapter 3, the first round of arguments we went through, and now we're in the middle of the second round of arguments. And now it's time for Zophar to speak out. He says, he's, this is Zophar the Namathite. He replies, My troubled thoughts prompt me to answer because I am greatly disturbed. I hear a rebuke that dishonors me, and my understanding inspires me to reply. Surely you know how it has been from of old, ever since mankind was placed on the earth, that the mirth of the wicked is brief, the joy of the godless lasts but a moment. Though the pride of the godless person reaches to the heavens, and his head touches the clouds, he will perish forever like his own dung. Those who have seen him will say, Where is he? Like a dream, he flies away, no more to be found, banished like a vision of the night. The eye that saw him will not see him again. His place will look on him no more. His children must make amends to the poor. His own hands must give back his wealth. The youthful vigor that fills his bones will lie with him in the dust. Though evil is sweet, in his mouth, and he hides it under his tongue, though he cannot bear to let it go and lets it linger in his mouth. Yet his food will turn sour in his stomach. It will become the venom of serpents within him. and He will spit out the riches he swallowed. God will make his stomach vomit them up, and he will suck the poison of serpents. The fangs of an adder will kill him. He will not enjoy the streams, the rivers flowing with honey and cream. What he toiled for, he must give back uneaten. And he will not enjoy the profit from his trading, for he has oppressed the poor and left them destitute. He has seized houses he did not build. Surely he will have no respite from his craving. He cannot save himself by his treasure. Nothing is left for him to devour. His prosperity will not endure. In the midst of his plenty, distress will overtake him. The full force of misery will come upon him. When he has filled his belly, God will vent his burning anger against him and rain down his blows on him. Though he flees from an iron weapon, a bronze-tipped arrow pierces him. He pulls it out of his back, the gleaming point out of his liver. Terrors will come over him. Total darkness lies in wait for his treasures. A fire unfanned will consume him and devour what is left in his tent. The heavens will expose his guilt. The earth will rise up against him. A flood will carry off his house, rushing waters on the day of God's wrath, such is the fate God allots the wicked, the heritage appointed for them by God. And here Zophar speaks these words to Job, and Job replies to him, Listen carefully to my words. Let this be the consolation you give me. Bear with me while I speak, and after I've spoken, mock on. Is my complaint directed to human being? Why should I not be impatient? Look at me and be appalled. Clap your hand over your mouth. When I think about this, I'm terrified. Trembling seizes my body. 
Why do the wicked live on, growing old and increasing in power? They see their children established around them, their offspring before their eyes. Their homes are safe and free from fear. The rod of God is not on them. Their bulls never fail to breed. Their cows calve and do not miscarry. They send forth their children as a flock. Their little ones dance about. They sing to the music of timbrel and lyre. They make merry to the sound of the pipe. They spend their years in prosperity and go down to the grave in peace. Yet they say to God, leave us alone. We have no desire to know your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? What would we gain by praying to him? But their prosperity is not in their own hands. So I stand aloof from the plans of the wicked. Yet how often is the lamp of the wicked snuffed out? How often does calamity come upon them, the fate God allots in his anger? And how often are they like straw before the wind, like chaff swept away by a gale? It is said, God stores up the punishment of the wicked for their children. Let him repay the wicked so that they themselves will experience it. Let their own eyes see their destruction. Let them drink the cup of the wrath of the Almighty. For what do they care about the families they leave behind when their allotted months come to an end? Can anyone teach knowledge to God since he judges even the highest? One person dies in full vigor, completely secure and at ease, well nourished in body, bones rich with marrow. Another dies in bitterness of soul, never having enjoyed anything good. Side by side, they lie in the dust and worms cover them both. I know full well what you're thinking, the schemes by which you would wrong me. You say, where now is the house of the great, the tents where the wicked lived? Have you never questioned those who travel? Have you paid no regard to their accounts that the wicked are spared from the day of calamity, that they are delivered from the day of wrath? Who denounces their conduct to their face? Who repays them for what they have done? They are carried to the grave and Watch is kept over their tombs. The soil in the valley is sweet to them. Everyone follows after them, and a countless throng goes before them. So how can you console me with your nonsense? Nothing is left of your answers but falsehood, Job says to them. And now we see the rounding out of these two separate times that they have spoken, and Eliphaz said his part, Job responded. Bildad has said his part, Job responded. Zophar has said his part a second time, and Job responded. Now we come in to the third round of arguments as we're moving forward here, and it starts again. Remember, we're seeing three volleys of the same progression, but if you'll notice here, in uh, the next one that we go into, that Zophar does not speak in the third round of arguments, it's just Eliphaz and Bildad. So we're going to go straight into that now, as we see in the scripture. Then Eliphaz, the Temanite, replied, this is the third volley, Can a man be of benefit to God? Can even a wise person benefit him? What pleasure would it give the Almighty if you were righteous? What would he gain if your ways were blameless? It is for your piety that he rebukes you and brings charges against you. Is not your wickedness great or not your sins endless? You demanded security from your relatives for no reason. You stripped people of their clothing, leaving them naked. You gave no water to the weary, and you withheld food from the hungry. Though you were a powerful man, owning land, an honored man, living on it, and you sent widows away empty-handed and broke the strength of the fatherless. That is why snares are all around you. Why sudden peril terrifies you, why it is so dark you cannot see, and why a flood of water covers you. Is not God in his heights of heaven, and see how lofty are the highest stars? Yet you say, what does God know? Does he judge through such darkness? Thick clouds veil him, so he does not see us as he goes about in the vaulted heavens. Will you keep to the old path the wicked have trod. 
They were carried off before their time. Their foundations washed away by a flood. They said to God, leave us alone. What can the Almighty do to us? Yet it was He who filled their houses with good things. So I stand aloof from the plans of the wicked. The righteous see their ruin and rejoice. The innocent mock them, saying, Surely our foes are destroyed, and fire devours their wealth. Submit to God, and be at peace with Him. In this way, prosperity will come to you. Accept instruction from His mouth, and lay up His words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. If you remove wickedness far from your tent, and assign your nuggets to the dust, your gold of Ophir to the rocks in the ravines. Then the Almighty will be your gold, the choicest silver for you. Surely then you will find delight in the Almighty and will lift up your face to God. You will pray to Him and He will hear you and you will fulfill your vows. What you decide on will be done and light will shine on your ways. When people are brought low and you say, lift them up, then he will save the downcast. He will deliver even one who is not innocent, who will be delivered through the cleanness of your hands. Okay, Eliphaz says this to Job, and Job replies in the 23rd chapter, saying, and Job says, Even today my complaint is bitter, his hand is heavy in spite of my groaning. If only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to his dwelling. I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would find out what he would answer me and consider what he would say to me. Would he vigorously oppose me? No, he would not press charges against me. There the upright can establish their innocence before him. And there I would be delivered forever from my judge. If I go to the east, he is not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When he is at work in the north, I do not see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. My feet have closely followed his steps. I have kept to his way without turning aside. I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. But he stands alone, and who can oppose him? He does whatever he pleases. He carries out his decree against me, and many such plans he still has in store. That is why I am terrified before him when I think of all this. I fear him. God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. Yet I am not silenced by the darkness, by the thick darkness that covers my face. Here, Job is responding, replying, and then Job is now going to continue with what is considered one last declaration he gives, as it's called the closing declaration of Job after this third round. And as I said before, Zophar does not speak in this time. And it goes straight into Job closing this meeting out there with his friends in these arguments. And he goes on uh, to say here in um, um, the third round, Job 24. Oh, that's right. We still see in Job's response in 24. I'm sorry. And then we have not gotten to Bill Dead yet. Uh, why does the Almighty not set times for judgment? Why must those who know him look in vain for such days. There are those who move boundary stones. They pasture flocks they have stolen. They drive away the orphan's donkey and take the widow's ox and pledge. They thrust the needy from the path and force all the poor of the land into hiding. Like wild donkeys in the desert, the poor go about their labor of foraging food. The wasteland provides food for their children. They gather fodder in the fields and glean in the vineyards of the wicked, lacking clothes. They spend the night naked. They have nothing to cover themselves in the cold. They're drenched by mountain rains and hug the rocks for lack of shelter. The fatherless child is snatched from the breast. The infant of the poor is seized for a debt. Lacking clothes, they go about naked. They carry the sheaves but still go hungry. They crush olives among the terraces. They tread the wine presses, yet suffer thirst. 
The groans of the dying rise from the city, and the souls of the wounded cry out for help. But God charges no one with wrongdoing. There are those who rebel against the light, who do not know its ways or stay in its paths. When daylight is gone, the murderer rises, kills the poor and needy, and in the night steals forth like a thief. The eye of the adulterer watches for dusk. He thinks, no eye will see me, and he keeps his face concealed. In the dark, thieves break into houses, but by day they shut themselves in. They want nothing to do with the light, for all of them, Midnight is their morning, and they make friends with the terrors of darkness, yet they are foam on the surface of the water. Their portion of the land is cursed, so that no one goes to the vineyards. As heat and drought snatch away the melted snow, so the grave snatches away those who have sinned. The womb forgets them, and the worm feasts on them. The wicked are no longer remembered, but are broken like a tree. They prey on the barren and childless woman, and to the widow they show no kindness. But God drags away the mighty by his power. Though they become established, they have no assurance of life. He may let them rest in a feeling of security, but his eyes are on their ways. For a little while they are exalted, and then they are gone. They are brought low and gathered up like all others. They are cut off like heads of grain. If this is not so, who can prove me false and reduce my words to nothing? Here Job responds entirely to what Eliphaz has to say, and then we go on to Bildad, where he says, Then Bildad the Shudat replied, Dominion and all belong to God. He establishes order in his heights of heaven. Can his forces be numbered? Are on whom does his light not rise? How then can a mortal be righteous before God? How can one born of woman be pure? If even the moon is not bright and the stars are not pure in his eyes, how much less a mortal who is but a maggot, a man, a human being who is only a worm. Here Bildad says this very simply. Uh, to Job, and Job comes right after and says back to Bildad, How you have helped the powerless! How you have saved the arm that is feeble! What advice you have offered to one without wisdom! And what great insight you have displayed! Who has helped you utter these words? And whose spirit spoke from your mouth? Notice that Job uses a small s here to describe whose spirit. Now, the dead are in deep anguish, those beneath the waters and all that live in them. The realm of the dead is naked before God. Destruction lies uncovered. He spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. He wraps up the waters in his clouds, yet the clouds do not burst under their weight. He covers the face of the full moon, spreading his clouds over it. He marks out the horizon on the face of the waters, a boundary between light and darkness. The pillars of the heavens quake, aghast at his rebuke. By his power, he churned up the sea. By his wisdom, he cut Rahab to pieces. By his breath, he, the skies become fair. His hand pierced the gliding serpent. And these are but the outer fringe of his works. How faint the whisper we hear of him. Who then can understand the thunder of his power? And Job says this in response to Bildad, now he comes into what I said a moment ago before I realized where we were. Job's closing declaration is now this. Job continued his discourse, as surely as God lives, who has denied me justice, the Almighty, who has made my life bitter, as long as I have life within me, the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not say anything wicked, and my tongue will not utter lies. I will never admit you're in the right till I die. I will not deny my integrity. I will maintain my innocence and never let go of it. My conscience will not reproach me as long as I live. May my enemy be like the wicked, my adversary like the unjust. For what hope have the godless 
when they are cut off, when God takes away their life? Does God listen to their cry when distress comes upon them? Will they find delight in the Almighty? Will they call on God at all times? I will teach you about the power of God, the ways of the Almighty I will not conceal. You have all seen this yourselves. Why then this meaningless talk? Here is the fate God allots to the wicked, the heritage a ruthless man receives from the Almighty. However many his children, their fate is the sword. His offspring will never have enough to eat. The plague will bury those who survive him, and their widows will not weep for them, though he heaps up silver like dust and clothes like piles of clay. What he lays up for the righteous will wear, and the innocent will divide his silver. The house he builds is like a moth's cocoon, like a hut made by a watchman. He lies down wealthy, but will do so no more. When he opens his eyes, all is gone. Terrors overtake him like a flood. A tempest snatches him away in the night. The east wind carries him off and he is gone. It sweeps him out of his place. It hurls itself against him without mercy as he flees headlong from its power. It claps its hands in derision and hisses him out of his place. Here, this closing declaration comes from the three sets of arguments. Now, the three of them have spoken Eliphaz and Bildad. The first round was Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, and Job responded to each. And the second, again, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, Job responds. And now the third, just Eliphaz and Bildad. And Job makes this declaration finally to these arguments. And then we come into a moment in the outlining we see here where it's called a wise intermission. And this is a moment that is the 28th chapter where uh, Job or this intermission is the, the speaking of um, the passage is about Job's declaration of words of wisdom in this intermission. Now, this is a middle point. In fact, this is, this is what we will finish with in this lesson. But let's go straight into it. Job chapter 28. There is a mine for silver and a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth and copper is smelted from ore. Mortals put an end to the darkness. They search out the farthest recesses for ore in the blackest darkness. Far from human dwellings, they cut a shaft in places untouched by human feet. Far from other people, they dangle and sway. The earth from which food comes is transformed below as by fire. Lapis lazuli comes from its rocks and its dust contains nuggets of gold. No bird of prey knows the hidden path, and no falcon's eye has seen it. Proud beasts do not set foot on it, and no lion prowls there. People assault the flinty rock with their hands and lay bare the roots of the mountains. They tunnel through the rock. Their eyes see all its treasures. They search the sources of the rivers and bring hidden things to light. But where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? No mortal comprehends its worth. It cannot be found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me. The sea says, it is not with me. It cannot be bought with the finest gold, nor can its price be weighed out in silver. It cannot be bought with the gold of Ophir, with precious onyx or lapis lazuli. Neither gold nor crystal can compare with it, nor can it be had for jewels of gold. Coral and jasper are not worthy of mention. The price of wisdom is beyond rubies. The topaz of Cush cannot compare with it. It cannot be bought with pure gold. Where then does wisdom come from? Where does understanding dwell? 
It is hidden from the eyes of every living thing, concealed even from the birds in the sky. Destruction and death say, only a rumor of it has reached our ears. God understands the way to it, and he alone knows where it dwells, for he views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he established the force of the wind and measured out the waters, when he made a decree for the rain and a path for the thunderstorm, then he looked at wisdom and appraised it. He confirmed it and tested it. And he said to the human race, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. This wise interaction of the words of this intermission where Job just makes one more declaration about this, wisely speaking about all the great things. In fact, there's so many principles that are outlined here that for the age of this book are astounding, that speak about the ways that men work, the mines that were dug way back then. This is speaking about the extraction of ores, the seeking out of gems in the earth, the the panning of gold from rivers, all of the same things that we see today that man still does. There are still mines. They're still going down to the foundations of, of, of earth to seek out these stones, just as they did so many thousands of years ago in the writing of this book, which goes deep, deep, deep into the Old Testament. And these principles are there. And Job is speaking to these people He's remaining in his own perspective and idea. He's not submitted to their ideals. He's not submitted to their counsel. And so now we come into what's referred to as the monologues. And this is from Job 29 all the way to Job 42. And as we come into this monologue, the first that we see is Job's call for vindication. So for three chapters here, he cries out in these each sections his past honor and blessings, number one. Number two, his present dishonor and suffering. And then number three, his protestations of innocence and final oath. So let's do that now. Chapter 29, as we continue, his past honor and blessing, we see where Job continued his discourse. How I long for the months gone by for the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone on my head, and by his light I walked through darkness. Oh, for the days when I was in my prime, when God's intimate friendship blessed my house, when the Almighty was still with me and my children were around me, when my path was drenched with cream and the rock poured out for me, streams of olive oil. When I went to the gate of the city and took my seat in the public square and the young men saw me and stepped aside and the old men rose to their feet, the chief men refrained from speaking and covered their mouths with their hands. The voices of the nobles were hushed and their tongues stuck to the roof of their mouths. And whoever heard me speak well, spoke well of me and those who saw me commended me because I rescued the poor who cried for help and the fatherless who had none to assist them. The one who was dying blessed me. I made the widow's heart sing. I put on righteousness as my clothing. Justice was my robe and my turban. I was, I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy. I took up the case of the stranger. I broke the fangs of the wicked and snatched the victims from their teeth. I thought, I will die in my own house, my days as numerous as the grains of sand. My roots will reach to the water and the dew will lie all night on my branches. My glory will not fade. The bow will be ever new in my hand. The bow. People listened to me expectantly, waiting in silence for my counsel. After I had spoken, they spoke no more. My words fell gently on their ears and they waited for me as for showers and drank in my words as the spring rain. When I smiled at them, they scarcely believed it. The light of my face was precious to them. I chose the way for them and set as their chief. I dwelt as a king among his troops. I was like one who comforts mourners. Job is here remembering his past and 
He's saying this is his past honor and blessings. He had such a great position. Not only was it his wealth, but it was his fame, his relationship with people, his reputation, and everyone spoke well of him and listened to him, and he had this influence and this authority and this power before all this happened. And he's just remembering the past and how great it was when all the blessings were there. But now he turns to his present dishonor in suffering in chapter 30. But now they mock me, men younger than I, whose fathers I would have disdained to put with my sheepdogs of what use was the strength of their hands to me since their vigor had gone from them. Haggard from want and hunger, they roam the parched land in desolate wastelands at night. In the brush they gathered salt herbs and their food was the root of the broom bush. They were banished from human society, shouted at as if they were thieves. They were forced to live in the dry stream beds among the rocks and the holes in the ground. They brayed among the bushes and huddled in the undergrowth, a base and nameless brood. They were driven out from the land, and now those young men mock me in song. I have become a byword among them. They detest me and keep their distance. They do not hesitate to spit in my face. Now that God has unstrung my bow and afflicted me, they throw off restraint in my presence. On my right, the tribe attacks and they lay snares for my feet. They build their siege ramps against me. They break up my road. They succeed in destroying me. and No one can help him, they say. They advance as though a gaping breach amid the ruins. They come rolling in. Terrors overwhelm me. My dignity is driven away as by the wind, and my safety vanishes like a cloud. Now my life ebbs away. Days of suffering grip me. Night pierces my bones. My gnawing pains never rest. In his great power, God becomes like clothing to me. He binds me like the neck of my garment. and He throws me into the mud and I am reduced to dust and ashes. I cry out to you, God, but you do not answer. I stand up, but you merely look at me. You turn on my ruthlessly. You turn on me ruthlessly. With the might of your hand, you attack me. You snatch me up and drive me before the wind. You toss me about in the storm. I know you will bring me down to death, to the place appointed for all the living. Surely no one lays a hand on a broken man when he cries for help in his distress. Have I not wept for those in trouble? Has not my soul grieved for the poor? Yet when I hoped for good, evil came. When I looked for light, then came darkness. The churning inside me never stops. Days of suffering comfort me. I go about blackened, but not by the sun. I stand up in the assembly and cry for help, and I have become a brother of jackals and a companion of owls. My skin grows black and peels. My body burns with fever. My leer is turned to mourning, and my pipe to the sound of wailing. Here, clearly, he speaks of his past and then his present and now he goes on in one more chapter we read the protestations of of innocence where he continues speaking out and saying i made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at young women for what is our lot from god above our heritage from the almighty on high it is it not ruin for the wicked disaster for those who do wrong does he not see my ways and count my every step if i have walked with falsehood or my foot has hurried after deceit, let God weigh me in honest scales, and he will know that I am blameless. If my steps have turned from the path, if my heart has been led by my eyes, or if my hands have been defiled, then may others eat with what I have sown, and may my crops be uprooted. If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door, then may my wife grind another man's grain, and may other men sleep with her. For that would have been wicked, a sin to be judged. 
it is a fire that burns to destruction, it would have uprooted my harvest. If I have denied justice to any of my servants, whether male or female, when they had a grievance against me, what will I do when God confronts me? What will I answer when called to account? Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one form us both within our mothers? If I have denied the desires of the poor or let the eyes of the widow grow weary, if I have kept my bread to myself, not sharing it with the fatherless, but from my youth I've reared them as a father would, and from my birth I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone perishing for lack of clothing or the needy without garments, and their hearts did not bless me for warming them with the fleece, from my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless, knowing that I had influence in court, then let my arm fall from the shoulder, let it be broken off at the joint. For I dreaded destruction from God, and for fear of his splendor I could not do such things. If I put my trust in gold, or said to Pure gold, you are my security. If I have rejoiced over my great wealth, the fortune my hands had gained, if I have regarded the sun in its radiance or the moon moving in splendor so that my heart was secretly enticed and my hand offered them a kiss of homage, then these also would be sins to be judged, for I would have been unfaithful to God on high. If I have rejoiced at my enemy's misfortune or gloated over the trouble that came to him, I have not allowed my mouth to sin by invoking a curse against their life. If those of my household have never said, who has not been filled with Job's meat? But no stranger had to spend the night in the street, for my door was always open to the traveler. If I have concealed my sin, as people do, by hiding my guilt in my heart because I so feared the crowd and so dreaded the contempt of the clans that I kept silent and would not go outside, oh, that I had someone to hear me, I sign now my defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser put his indictment in writing. Surely I would wear it on my shoulder. I would put it on my, me like a crown. I would give him an account of my every step. I would present it to him as to a ruler. If my land cries out against me and all its furrows are wet with tears, if I have devoured its yield without payment or broken the spirit of its tenants, then let briars come up instead of wheat and stink weed instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. Here, the first monologue, 29, 30, 31, Job speaks out entirely what he feels in this monologue. It's called because it is not a discussion. Before it was tit for tat. Before Elihu would, I mean, um, before, I'm sorry, um, one would say something, the other would say something, and this is what we saw in the conversations, but now these are the monologues that he speaks. And after having said all this, there's one more that is going to speak that we'll see in our next lesson, who is Elihu. But in this, these past chapters, 29, his past honor and blessing, he remembered all the great place that he had and all that. He was looking back with sorrow, how great it was. And then he reflected on the fact that now is only dishonor and suffering in chapter 30. And then in 31, he claims one more time, I'm innocent. If I had done something wrong, yeah, maybe I deserve this. But I was always there for people. I was always kind, always compassionate, always providing for the widows, the fatherless. I was always there for the strangers. He basically was fulfilling Matthew 25 and loving the least of those as brothers and doing everything and providing for them and being upright. And he cannot, for the life of him, find a reason why God would cause him to suffer like this. And there he is still looking like we all do for a reason why. That's what this entire book is about. Why, why, why? 
And now we've seen all these chapters already in this course that we're discussing and all the words and the conjectures and the thoughts and the ideas and we're still going to hear Elihu and his arguments in our next lesson before God ever speaks and then we're going to finally hear what God has to say and his words are the words that we're waiting for. Everything's building up to finally God speaking to us in chapter 38 and onward. And that is what matters most. And finally, he's going to set these people straight. He's going to bring correction. We're working our way up to that, but we have to establish all of these other thoughts first. So I'm glad to be doing it with you. So we're going to stop here. And in the next session, we're going to listen to Elihu and then go into God's perspective and what God says to us when we are asking these desperate questions of why when we suffer in life.